So my journey into healthcare actually started with Wall Street. Um, so I was investing in healthcare companies. I would invest in everything from birth to death. And there's no better way. You do a lot of things on Wall Street. Um, you learn about money, et cetera. You make money. Um, but the best thing I learned is actually how the healthcare system worked. And there's no better way to actually really learn these things than understanding what all those financial incentives are. So sadly, um, one of the things that I learned was that I'm not in charge of my own health. And the more I started to dig into it, I started to realize that um, my insurance companies made decisions for me. Um, my hospital had policies and they would make decisions for me. And then the pharmacy benefit managers, they would decide which medications I may or may not be getting. Um, and then obviously you have your physician and physicians come with different sets of training and different sets of biases, different sets of information. So I realized um, that I actually wasn't really the decision maker in my own health. And I kind of started to look at, uh, there's three, these three questions that I um, sort of think about, and Institute of Medicine actually did a study of these, sort of looking at this idea of who's in charge, do people know who's in charge, how much will it cost, and why are they getting treated? Um, and shockingly, what they found is that 75% of patients don't actually know who's in charge of their care. And that over two-thirds of them have no idea how much it's going to cost. And then, shockingly for me, is that roughly 50% don't really know what the pros and cons are of the treatment that they're even getting. So here they are, they're in the hospital, they don't know who's in charge, they don't know how much it's gonna cost, and they don't really know why they're getting it. So it's kind of a sad state. Um, so this actually has never been a problem for my family though. Um, and as we were digging through my medical records to own them and to, to have them, we found this note and it says, note this mother has had a hard time being rational as many of us in pediatrics know. And, um, and I love this because those of you who know my mother, like my mother is very animated and slightly crazy, um, but very passionate about her health and very passionate about advocating for her own health and for her children. And so why? Um, and so this is a story of my mother. My mother, um, this is my mother and her little brother, David. Uh, and unfortunately, um, David died. And when my mother was 10 years old and David was 18 months old, David ate a bottle of aspirin. And they knew he ate the bottle of aspirin, but they took him from hospital to hospital to try and get him care. And they were sent home, they pumped his stomach, they told him just to take a nap. And so late at night when he was screaming, they finally got a hospital to take him. And um, they left, they sent my grandparents and my mother home. And in the morning they called and they said, David is in the morgue. And the conclusion from that, from my mother, um, was very clear that if you don't take care of yourself, no one else will. And my mother always slapped this down on us really hard, that if you're not responsible and you're not advocating, everyone else is gonna be taking advantage of you, and that you have to stand up for yourself. And so for that reason, my mother has this fierce passion when it comes to her health. And that was the story for 23andMe is that when I started, when I saw the genome exploding and I saw the potential, I said, I want to get access to this. This is my genome and I actually want to know what's in it. So the mission of 23andMe was about those three points, about we want to enable people to access their genome, we want to enable people to understand it, so therefore get complicated information, actually make sense of it, and then to benefit from it, which is actually some of the research element, which was something that I realized in Wall Street, genomics was not actually being integrated into a lot of research studies. So the potential of genomic medicine, why do I even care about the genome? So I saw the genome being uh, decoded in 2000, and it was super exciting. Everyone was writing these reports about what was gonna happen with the genome. That, you know, genetics, like the fact that it was out and we sequenced the whole genome, that everything was gonna be this watershed of what was gonna happen. And I actually had this report from the head of research and development from Roche, and I, I hung it on my wall, and I used to read it all the time of, wow, medicine is gonna change, and this was sort of my naive 25-year-old optimism on Wall Street. Like, the industry is going to change. And what was so exciting? Well, I was super excited about knowing 
my healthcare risks early. I was excited to know something like, if I am going to get Alzheimer's and I do have the ApoE4 variants, is there something I can do? Because the beauty of genomics is that there is this interaction between your lifestyle and your genome. And therefore, if I know what my genome is, well then great, I should understand what my lifestyle should be. So this potential that I should know risk because it's so much better for me to prevent a disease. All of us would much rather say like, oh, you know, I prevented Alzheimer's. I didn't necessarily successfully treat it and manage it. That's not fun, but we want to prevent. And then second is that we want to prevent drug side effects. And that if you can understand, if I look in this room, lots of people get side effects. Like my poor kids get horrible reactions to actually um, injections. So understanding who actually is going to get those side effects. And as of today, there's certain medications out there where you can see who is actually, you know, based on the genome, who is going to get a side effect. But then predicting drug response. There's nothing worse than going and getting a medication and having it not work. And you look at two common areas like hypertension and depression where the medications tend to not work very well and people cycle through the medications and you don't know how to start dosing. So it would be great to actually use the genomics to actually see could you actually predict who's gonna respond. And then enabling precision medicine, which we're starting to see in these days, is that we'll all say breast cancer is not just breast cancer. It's lots of different types of breast cancers, and it's lots of different types of disease, and understanding the molecular level of disease. And then powering research breakthroughs, and that is the, the drug development side. Actually, instead of having a $2 billion bill for drug discovery, actually, can you use the genome to actually make it go much faster? So I was really excited about genomics, and we launched, and, and me getting my own genome, and we launched as a direct-to-consumer company. And for those of you who have followed the story, direct-to-consumer, a direct-to-consumer business was equivalent to a mild level of brain damage. Um, it has been, there are definitely easier routes to do a genomics company than as a direct-to-consumer company. And so why did I feel so strongly about it being direct to consumer? And that's again from the Wall Street days when I realized that what I want as a consumer does not necessarily align with the financial incentives of the system, is that those two things are different. And because you in this room, you don't pay the bill, you pay part of the bill, but you don't pay it, you're not the decision maker, you're not actually getting a lot of the choice there, that you're not actually getting always what you should be getting or what you might want. And so a couple examples. I love this study. This is a study from 1961 that looked at physician, behave, fit, physician attitudes about telling their patients whether or not they have cancer. And so in this day and age, it would be seen as crazy if you went to the doctor and you had cancer and they didn't tell you. But in 1961, over 90% of physicians said they just don't want to tell their patients. So, so as much as we complain about healthcare, I do like to point out we've come, we've come pretty far. So the other thing I like to remind people, my sister, my sister works in obesity um, at UCSF, and so she always talks about, oh, there's this crisis, and um, you know, it's going to sink the system. And I'm like, no, it's an awesome money-making opportunity. These people don't just like, get sick and die. They like, get heart disease and diabetes and things for like decades. That's awesome from a Wall Street perspective. So it's useful to remember that it's easy to monetize you, and disease is monetized. So one of the things that I love is a physician once raised his hand at a conference and he said, the biggest problem with 23andMe is you generate non-billable questions. And so again, all these things are reasons why I felt like it was so important that 23andMe is a direct-to-consumer company and not necessarily through the, the existing system because to really enable all of you to get access to it, it has to be direct-to-consumer. So another example, this is my friend Monica, and if you look at Monica, you say, well, what, what's her ethnicity? Um, and you can't really tell, and this is, you know, a lot of genomics today is based on what we profile you to be, what we racially profile you to be. And this is an example for Ashkenazis. Um, we will tell you X number of different diseases that you probably want to get tested for because you're of Jewish descent. But how do we know, really, if you're of Jewish descent? And this is something that 23andMe does, is we actually tell people what their ancestry composition is, and you can see what is the definition of being Jewish. If I'm 8.7%, am I Jewish? 
Does that, do I have the risk? And so this causes concern for rabbis, but it also causes concerns for the American College of Medical Genetics of how do you actually define this? And so this is something that we did. We did this study in breast cancer, in BRCA, and we actually saw that roughly 20% of the customers that we have who have that genetic mutation did not report as being Jewish or they didn't think they were Jewish. So it just shows, as much as you all think you know your backgrounds, or you may or may, I might be able to profile you in a certain way, it's only gonna be of mild success. And so much of our decisions about genetics in this system are based on that profiling. So consumers really benefit from a direct access model because it's gonna introduce the technology faster and it's gonna identify people. It's gonna identify all those people that would otherwise be missed by just profiling them. But, the big but, um, it's obviously very clear that direct-to-consumer comes with some regulatory issues. And um, this is our warning that says, by the way, this is a device, um, you know, we've, called, we've looked through our files and you're a device and you didn't register with us. So um, we suddenly became 23 and stupid, um, where, <laughs> uh, one of my favorite articles ever, where it became, you know, we were told that we had to stop returning the results. Um, and it took us about two years to figure out what we needed to do and to come back. And it's one of the things that I've learned is that as much as you're introducing a new technology and we're introducing things in a different way, you have to work somewhat within the system. And we had failed to necessarily have the right style of communication, the right cadence of communication. And so we finally, and we did the work finally that we need to do, which was all very reasonable work, but it is a good message to all of us innovators out there in the healthcare space that there is a path and you have to follow forward with that path within that regulated system. So we are now, um, I, I feel like I, my kids think I'm Buzz Lightyear, um, 23 Me's Triumph. Um, and what we did is we showed how accurate the test actually is, that we have a 99% positive predictive value, 99% negative predictive value with a 95% confidence interval. And over 90% of the customers have a compre have a, have understand the information that they're getting. So it's phenomenal. So we actually then got this quote from the FDA saying, in many circumstances, you don't necessarily need to go through a physician for your genetic information. So one of the things that we've concluded with this is as much as there's a lot of physicians out there in this room, is that one-to-one -one interaction with a physician necessarily the gold standard that we've all been taught to believe? And that the reality is to keep costs down, we need to develop scalable models for healthcare, and one of that is leveraging the web, leveraging reusable content in videos, leveraging you know, written materials or the crowdsourcing. So is that one-to-one -one interaction necessarily the gold standard for how you have to deliver all of your care? And then next, I think more and more what we're learning is that healthcare is not about that episodic visit to your doctor where you get a black and white screen of like, are you healthy, are you not healthy? But it's really about what you do every day and as sad as I am that bacon's off the list now, like, you realize that people need to learn to make choices, and that being direct to consumer inspires people to think about their health on a daily basis, and think about what they're eating, what they're doing, and you start to see healthcare moving from the hospital and your clinics into Walmart because that is where people go every day. And if I am genetically at risk for Alzheimer's, wouldn't it be great if Walmart could say, hey, aisle seven, running shoes. Like that's a profit incentive that I'm okay with. So I think that's where we're gonna start to see healthcare evolving. So I just wanna end with reminding all of you that you are in charge of your own health and that as much as the system has sort of taught you that you are not and that we need to rely on others, it is your right and your ability to ask for your information, ask for your medical records, know why you're getting something. Don't be pushed around into just doing something because if you don't, your life could depend on it. And so just to end with my mother's quote, that, <laughs> that if you don't take care of yourself, no one will. Thank you.